Now, hypertension is is an epidemic. Fine. Every fifth to sixth person has high blood pressure. You all know that a blood pressure of more than 140 by 90 millimeters of mercury is known as hypertension. And you also know the, some, uh, that the common drugs available in the hypertension treatment are A, B, C, D. So, you have ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers for A, B for beta blockers, C for calcium channel blockers, D for diuretics. Okay? So, hypertension is one topic from which you can ask, be asked question particularly regarding the management or drug of choice in various hypertensive emergencies and uh, questions about certain syndromes that are responsible for hypertension. So, let us just go through few of the questions that have been asked in last uh, two or three years okay, related to hypertension. So, one of the questions was what is Liddell syndrome? Right? So, and we, uh, so uh, you have to know what is Liddell syndrome. Regarding Liddell syndrome which is false? Fine. So, the answer to this question is excessive loss of sodium and water causing salt wasting. So, this is false. Why? Because Liddell syndrome occurs because of an epithelial sodium channel mutation that leads to activation of amyloride sensitive epithelial sodium channel in the distal renal tubules as a result of which the excess sodium absorption occurs leading to sodium and water retention leading to hypertension and the treatment is amyloride. Indian population in general is highly susceptible to coronary artery disease at almost 10 years earlier to the western population which means young population someone like me someone like you at the age of 35 45 is more likely to get an heart attack whereas in the western world this occurs at the age of after 60 60 and 70 and that is why this topic is one of the topics from which you will always have one question in the exam. So, some people call it ischemic heart disease, some like to call it coronary artery disease, still others like to call it coronary heart disease. Okay? So, let us see what are the questions that have been asked. So, all of the following are true about angina pectoris except. So, so uh, if you look at ischemic heart disease, it has three basic manifestations or two broad manifestations. One is acute coronary syndrome and the second is chronic coronary syndrome also known as chronic stable angina. Right? So, angina pectoris is a manifestation of chronic stable angina. Right? Acute coronary syndrome can manifest as either unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction or ST elevation myocardial infarction. So, this question deals with the stable component of ischemic heart disease. Okay? So, all of the following are true except. So, Levine sign, yes, it is classic of angina pectoris. It can be crescendo, decrescendo, it is short lasting and usually relieves within 2 to 5 minutes of rest or sublingual sorbitrate often radiates to trapezius. So, this is a feature which is more commonly seen in pericarditis. Now, let us just move us to the next question which is from acute coronary syndrome. Okay? So, which of, so, which of the following best describes the most common pathophysiological mechanism? Okay? So, most common pathophysiological mechanism present during STEMI, ST elevation MI. It is a life threatening condition. One thing that you must know how to manage and how to diagnose. Okay? So, what is the most common pathophysiological mechanism of STEMI? So, remember ST elevation myocardial infarction or any acute coronary syndrome for that matter occurs because of changes in the plaques. So, either the atherosclerotic plaque can erode, can rupture, right? All right? These are the two main mechanisms, right? So, of these which is most commonly responsible for myocardial infarction, STEMI is coronary plaque rupture. So, what happens is atherosclerotic plaque ruptures, right? And because there is a rupture of the plaque, all the uh, lipid, all the necrotic material gets exposed to the luminal blood and then there is a formation of thrombus leading to sudden occlusion of arterial supplies and ST elevation myocardial infarction. So, most common pathology, pathophysiological feature is coronary plaque rupture. Okay? Coronary spasm, vasospasm is pathophysiology of Prince metals, Prince metals angina. Okay? And coronary uh, plaque erosion usually results in non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Okay? Progression causing progressive stenosis is responsible for chronic stable angina. Okay? Now, when is fibrinolytic therapy not indicated in a facility not capable of PCI? Now, indication and contraindication of fibrinolysis therapy is one question that will always be asked. It is a very high yield topic and this is one thing that is expected of you whenever you are working in any area to diagnose ST elevation MI, 
right and more and, and you know except for the urban cities and your know, metropolitan cities most of the places do not have facilities for primary pci primary percutaneous coronary intervention which is the treatment of choice for st elevation mi so what do you do you have to thrombolyze or fibrinolyze with drugs like streptokinase tenecteplase retiplase altiplase okay so this is one topic we mu which you must be thorough with know the indications of thrombolysis know the contraindications of thrombolysis you will be quizzed about this okay now remember if you have st elevation of more than 1 mm in two consecutive leads okay in a patient with a classic chest pain presenting to you within 6 to 12 hours of the onset of chest pain and not having any contraindication to thrombolysis then you these patients should be referred to primary pci if there is a facility available or thrombolyze okay now so the question is when is fibrinolytic therapy not indication so this is a question asking for the contraindication of fibrinolysis okay so 74 years so go go through all these options in the next slide i will list the contraindications for you to remember you have to remember and memorize this there is no other way out because this is a life threatening condition with high mortality and you must know when to thrombolyze when not to thrombolyze okay so the answer to this question is a prior intracranial hemorrhage so if you have a prior intracranial hemorrhage it's an absolute contraindication to thrombolysis okay pause the slide take your time to go through all the you know all the points that have been listed here i will just discuss one point which is kind of controversial uh, you know not exactly controversial but two books mention different values so level of blood pressure you know at which we should above which we should not thrombolyze so that's kind of you know so dicey so severe uncontrolled hypertension that is unresponsive to emergency therapy so this is what we cardiologists follow is an absolute uh, you know contraindicate which means if a patient comes to you with a blood pressure of say 190 by 120 and despite giving some nitroglycerin nitroprusside despite giving some beta blockers you're not able to bring down the blood pressure then that's an absolute contraindication to thrombolysis that's what we follow practically and that is what has been mentioned in the brownwell textbook of cardiology however harrison mentions that a blood pressure of more than 180 by 100 mm of mercury is an absolute contraindication right to thrombolysis right so just whenever if you have a question asking uh, uh, with the option of blood pressure as one of the contraindications look at the wordings okay if the wording is plain that a bp of more than 180 by 100 is it an absolute contraindication if that's the most likely answer and if the wording is plain you know you mark that as an option so if uh, the one of your options is more than 180 by 100 mark it as an option as a contraindication to fibrinolysis however uh if there are other better options that are absolute contraindications say for example aortic dissection past history of you know um, intracranial hemorrhage or ischemic stroke within last three months if you have other better options take that as the answer okay so this is slightly controversial point two books mention it differently so if you go by harrison if this is the value mentioned above which you should not thrombolyze but clinically practically and what brownwell mentions is if you are unable to control it in the emergency only then should it be controlled uh, considered as a absolute contraindication to fibrinolysis okay now this i have already told you treatment of choice for any patient of anterior wall mi within the window period is primary pcu now what is the window period window period is onset of chest pain to 12 hours so best is within 6 hours to 12 hours however you can still thrombolyze a patient after 12 hours if the patient is in cardiogenic shock theek okay? hai now this is a question that was asked and this is regarding the cardiac enzymes you can have a question regarding the cardiac enzymes however in the current scenario the most commonly used cardiac enzyme for patients of coronary artery disease or acute coronary syndrome is troponins okay but this was one of out of the way question just uh, remember that flipped ldh so flipped ldh indicating myocardial infection is represented by so there is no logic to this this is just a fact you have to understand that whenever ldh1 is more than ldh2 you know uh, that flipped ldh represents myocardial infarction So, which of the following is a preferential marker of acute MI in athletes? So, forget athletes. This is just for confusion. Preferential marker for acu any acute MI is troponin. That's the correct answer. 
okay so troponin troponin t and troponin i some you might also be given an option of high sensitive troponin t and troponin i right so these are the preferred action for myocardial infarction fine ckmb uh, is not the preferred if troponin is also an option. So, CKMB is used when we want to see reinfarction because CP, CKMB rises fast and disappears fast. Okay? So, tro most uh, apt answer for this question is troponin T. Now, what about C-reactive protein? So, it is an inflammatory marker. LDH is another marker. So, what I have done is one of the, because you have uh, questions from these biomarkers. So, this is a chart. Take your time to understand this chart. So, what are the questions that can be asked here? Let us have a look. Okay. So, one. So, which is the first biomarker to, you know, um, increase in myocardial infarction? That is a question. Myoglobin and CPKMB. That's the first to rise. Okay. Now, what about troponins? So, troponins do rise. Okay, they rise after the CPKMB, but they persist longer. So, trop T and trop I, troponin T and trop I can even last for two weeks. So, say one to two weeks. Okay. But look, look at CPKMB. So, CPKMB, you know, rises, uh, rises uh, early, but also settles down fast. Okay. So, that is why they can be used for reinfarction. But troponin I since it is persistent for you know uh, uh, one or two weeks, you cannot use it for reinfarction. Right. So, this is one chart that you must understand. It shows all the enzymes that rise after uh, myocardial infarction and the point that I wanted uh, another point that I wanted to make was that myoglobin and uh, CK isoforms are the first to rise. Okay. Now, dose of rete please. Now, you can be asked the dose of streptokinase which is 1.5 million units in 100 ml of normal saline to be given over 30 to 45 minutes. You can be asked dose of retiplase. So, it is uh, you know uh, 2 boluses of uh, 10 international units okay? and uh, you can be asked the dose of uh, tenecteplase which is almost around half the body weight.